of the most memorable events in our history books took place during the Stuart period. The Great Fire of London, the Great Plague, the Civil War, and one of the most famous assassination attempts of all time, the Gunpowder Plot. Guy Fawkes and his mob tried to blow up King James I and the Houses of Parliament with 36 barrels of gunpowder. But he was foiled by a tip-off and executed. So what's the connection with a milk float? Well, my first worst job is the Salt Peter Man. And his task was to collect the basic ingredient for gunpowder, which was Salt Peter. And in the 17th century, the most common way of getting saltpetre was by processing urine, lots of it. So in 1625, in London, they established this crazy kind of milk run. But instead of leaving milk on people's doorsteps, they went from door to door collecting urine that people had left out for them. Back then, they would have had a horse and cart with a barrel on the back. They did their rounds every other day in the winter and every day in the summer, when it was a hot, hard slog, not to mention sticky and smelly. Urine can be processed to produce potassium nitrate, saltpetre. And every drop was crucial, because the gunpowder plot kicked off a whole century of violence. It was the saltpetre man who fuelled every musket and cannon. But the insatiable demand was so high that most of his work was much harder. Britain's leading expert on the job took me trudging through the cold to a happy but smelly hunting ground for a salt peter man. Why did they bother coming out of the country with their barrows? Why didn't they just use the urine they got in the towns? Well, what they needed was the much higher levels of um, nitrates that you get when it's all rotted down into manure like this. How would they know where to look for it? It wasn't just dung heaps, was it? Well, it was dung heaps was a really good place, but actually anywhere where you've got uh, feces, urine, shit, basically. So, so outside so... people's houses? Oh, and inside. In fact, uh, they dug absolutely everywhere. But if you came to my house looking for dung, I'd tell you to push off. Oh, well, you could try that, of course, but the commissioners had the right rather like the VAT man today, to dig absolutely anywhere. And they were accused of digging in oh, people's chambers, uh, in, in bedrooms, even in the house of God. So not only were you breaking your back shoveling manure all day, but people hated you for invading their privacy. Contemporary reports indicate that although they were state-sanctioned, saltpeter men were often bully boys who had no qualms about bursting into people's homes. Who are the blokes who did this work? Oh, they were a real rabble of real nasty people, and probably a lovely reference to Rough Ralph and Welsh Will, who are two of the people, but they're often referred to in the papers and statements as, as the rabble. <laughs> so did they make much money out of this? Well, the people who did the shoveling didn't, of course, because they were on the bottom of the heap. But you can get some idea of how much money was in this when the guys that employed, the rabble as it were, were paying something like £1,700 for the privilege of being able to go and get the saltpeter. If that wasn't bad enough, you still had to get the nitrate crystals out of the muck by swilling it through with water and boiling it up, making an even worse stench. That do. Once purified, saltpeter needs to be combined with two other chemicals to make the black powder that Guy Fawkes was after. We did make an official request, but unfortunately the government politely declined. So we're not going to be able to blow up even the smallest part of the Houses of Parliament. But I don't want to disappoint you, there is going to be an explosion. Underneath this car is three kilograms of powder, which is roughly one five hundredth of the amount that Guy Fawkes used. So to demonstrate the efficacy of even a relatively small amount of gunpowder, here we are, just to make sure I'm not completely deafened by the blast. Two, one. Look at that! God, it's amazing, amazing, that hole! It really has actually just punched it through, hasn't it? Yeah, you wouldn't get much for that in the second-hand car market. Certainly not, it? now. It's like a giant has just gone boof! Yeah? <laughs> what it would have been like, 500 times that much amount of yeah. explosives yeah. inside the House of Commons. In the sort of bottom of the building, you know, the base of the building that it was in, it would have just taken the top of the building off and just flown it to smithereens. How much 
done would we need to get rid of the House of Commons? Something like between 50 and 75 tonnes of it. So in Salt Peter Man terms, that means that Rough Ralph and Co would have had to shift 1,500 wheelbarrows full. Between 1642 and 1646, the lives of workers all over England were thrown into bloody disarray by the Civil War. On one side, King Charles I and the Cavaliers, and on the other, Oliver Cromwell's Roundheads. For the ordinary men who were pressed into joining up, being maimed and killed became daily occupational hazards. This is Tutbury Castle in Derbyshire, and it was one of the last royalist strongholds. The king himself took shelter here, and it only fell to the Roundheads after four years of guerrilla warfare and a really long siege. And it's the technology of a siege that gives us one of the riskiest jobs of the war. The man who used a type of bomb called a petard to blow the castle gates down. A petard was the precursor of the modern hand grenade, except you didn't chuck it, you picked it up, ran along with it under your arm like a rugby ball and delivered it in person. By exploding a device against the gates, you aim to punch a hole in the weakest link of the fort's defences and gain entry for the rest of the troops. So you fix it onto your door. That's it. Then how do we know it's going to go in that direction and not that direction? Well, forces are equal and opposite, but the fact is that there's a wooden backing board and it's open, which means that when the explosion goes off, this nice iron container pushes all the explosion that way and punches a hole through the door. And what's in here? A fuse, uh, made of wood, uh, filled with a composition. It just goes in that, and that gives you some time to get away. So th what's this made of? That one would originally be made of cast iron or bronze, inside which 10 or 12 pounds of gunpowder. Who'd have made it? Petardier. He's employed purely to make these things to blow in walls. And he'd run up, fix it to the oh, wall and... No, no, no. Again. Far too valuable. You're going to have an assistant for that job, and that's the dangerous part of the work. Uh, Petardier makes this up on site, gives it to the assistants, because he's um, disposable. He's the one that has the job of getting up here, putting it in place and setting it on. One Petardier's assistant was George Cranage. He had to blow off the doors of Oswestry Castle and his preparation for the terrifying ordeal, getting completely drunk on sack, a type of sherry. Cranage was lucky, he survived, but the job was virtual suicide, so the assistants did all they could to improve their odds. You try and do this early in the morning or, you know, in the dusk, so you've got a bit of cover for that one. Get the element of surprise, so you're going to try and either leg it, wearing very little armour, or put lots of armour on and walk slowly, but feeling better protected. And then knowing they're going to try and shoot you, drop things on your head, and otherwise trying to spoil your day. And then, obviously, light the fuse and get away while they're still trying to kill you. What would he be lighting it with? Would he be fumbling with matches while he was here? Uh, he's going to have a piece of burning cord called slow match between his fingers, which really is... Um, Cord soaked in saltpeter, you dry it out and you, you light it. Your return journey was just as dangerous. Petards were so unpredictable, assistants were sometimes blown up as they tried to run away, hoist by their own petards. But what were the chances of getting hit by a musket or missile while running from your own lines to a gate? I wasn't prepared to die for the programme, but I wanted to analyse just how risky it could be. We're conducting a bit of an experiment. I'm going to see whether I can get from here right to those gates down there without being hit by musket fire. We've got four musketeers up on the walls who've exchanged their muskets for paintball, and I'm going to be protected by two flankers. This is Dave and Andrew from our production office. Thanks, mate. Because in Stuart times, the Petardier would have had some kind of soldiers running alongside him. But not only have I got to try and avoid being killed, but I would have had to have placed my petard strategically to ensure that I actually blasted the door off its hinges and didn't just create a, a little hole about four foot up, which would have been of no use to anybody. Can you do my mask for me? Okie doke. Right. Ready, Andy? Ready! <laughs> Go! 
adrenaline carried me through to the gate, and as there weren't going to be any real explosions, I had a flare to show that I'd made it. Done it! Done it! Done it, Andy. Well done. Well done, mate. Hey! Ah, uh, you <laughs> didn't do it. What do you mean we did it? Well, look down your leg, down your arm. Yeah. You didn't make it. They dropped uh, you about halfway in. Uh, you're not dead, but you're um, bleeding to death out there. Oh, but it felt so good. You know, I, you know what was extraordinary about it is I thought you'd be ducking around and <laughs> weaving around. You can't. When you're under fire like that, you just get your head down and bush you go. Absolutely. But I have to say, it does hurt like hell. Does it? All the way oh. down this side. Well, that's where they got you from that right hand side as you came in. <laughs> and uh, look at the, the petard as well. Look at that. Would that have exploded if it had been hit by muskets? No, it wouldn't do, because the, the musket balls aren't hot enough. But they may well have gone straight through the board and into you anyway, and that was against your chest. So I'd just be lying there bleeding, wouldn't I? I'm afraid so. <sighs> Good attempt, though. Yeah. I think we proved just how vulnerable the Petardier's assistant was in Stuart times, but then so was the king. When the parliamentarians broke the siege of Oxford in 1646, Charles I was put on trial and eventually beheaded. But he wouldn't even have got to the dock if it hadn't been for the two nameless men who took him there. Not in his usual regal carriage, but in the Stuart equivalent of a black cab, the sedan chair. Being a sedan chair bearer was a really tough job. They weren't just cabbies, they had to be the engine and the wheels as well. For wealthy stewards, sedan chairs became the most fashionable way to get around town. You could either hire them from set taxi ranks, initially in London and then further afield. There was one under the statue or around the statue of Charles I in Trafalgar Square today. Or you could book one for going to a performance or something in the evening. Could you hail it like a cab? Oh yes, you could hail it like a cab, but it would only be available if it was being carried the reverse way round to what? show that, well, you had to show that it was empty. Oh, I see. So that right, like the cab having the light on. Yes. They're pretty heavy, aren't they? Uh, well, this one is quite light. In fact, it's um, about 66 pounds. That's quite a lot to carry. Which, uh... What's, uh, what's this thing for? Uh, these are the straps. Why did you need those? Can you just carry them like well, that? Well, you, you could carry an empty one, but probably only about 100 or 200 metres, and then you start pulling your arms off. So the straps take the weight, and your arms, used for negotiation around the corners, hailing people. Must have been pretty difficult to manoeuvre this with poles this long. Yes, in the next century they got another foot longer. Why are they so long? Uh, well, really, the, when they converted from the original portable chair and they enclosed it, the person on the back couldn't see where they were going. So you needed to stand further back so that you could see, for instance, if you're looking at a flight of steps or some obstacle on the road, when it actually is. Sedan chairs were particularly popular during bad weather, so the bearers had to trudge through the wet and the cold. Slipping on ice was a real risk, so householders used to chuck their ashes onto the cobbles to provide a foothold. But there were worse dangers. And there was also aggro from uh, the footpads of the day, the street robbers, the carjackers of today. What, they try and mug the chairman? If it was a private one, you had to tackle the chairman first. But if it was just a taxi, we would stand back yeah. and almost open the door and let them, you know, mug the person inside for their jewellery, their watches. And so these guys are trotting along. Someone comes, opens the door, yeah. give us That's the... right. Well, in fact, there was what, there's one instance of someone being skewered with a sword right through the leather here. Oh, I've really got to have a go at this. Andrew, Tim, Hi. from the Oxford Uni Rugby Club. How much do you weigh? It's about 17 and a half stone. About 16 and a half. I chose the right people, didn't I? Right, you can go in. You're the lighter one. You're going to go on the back? Certainly will. Right. So, to, uh, presumably, I have to lock this bloke in. Indeed. Right, there you are. Tim, you got your strap on, Andrew? I have, Tony. Right. Is this the yep. right way around? Yep, just put that over. Just like that. Hang on, Andrew, just getting my straps on. Okay. Right, you ready? Yep. One, two, three, lift! Oh. Oh, it's not as bad as I thought. No, Hang on, I'm having a talk. You've got the, uh, the weight on the shoulders, haven't yeah, you, rather than yeah, that's right. the hand. Right. That sort of trot, really, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, we're just coming to a corner. Yeah, watch the bollard. Right. Did these things have lights on them for after dark? Oh, yes, you used to carry them on the side of the pole, or, or if you were wealthy, you could have a link bar in and pull one to oh. carry them on the front. Oh, he's going faster than me. Slow down a little bit. Oh, they always push hard from the back unless you ask them. Uh, not half. 
Was it the same fare where someone was fat or thin? Oh, yes. Ah, uh, yes, you have to pay the same fare, yeah. And uphill or downhill? Uh, they changed that in Bath. Uphill was more expensive. We're coming to a main road now. Hang on, I'm turning left. It's a bit, a bit like having a ladder, isn't you it? You've got a swing, yes. Yeah, you got a swing round. Right. Right. I don't want to go out in the road. Oh. You're doing well, oh. you're doing well. It's starting to flag now. Uh, that's oh. all right, in London. London, 52 miles, yeah. Huge wigs became emblems of the Stuart period. Charles II's wigs were almost as famous as his affair with Nell Gwynne. But big wigs made from real hair often contained unwelcome sitting tenants. Evicting them was the task of my next worst job, the nitpicker. If I call someone a nitpicker, I mean someone who's fairly pedantic. But in Stuart times, it was a real profession, wasn't it? It was, and it was an important job. People had nits and lice on the body and nits in the hair, and we had to get rid of them. And there's lots of uh, evidence of people who worked in families or would go from house to house with a specific job of getting nits out of people's hair. All right, I'm a Stuart noble. How do you get the uh, nits out of my hair? What's difficult about it is there's curls here, and these curls will hold the little tiny eggs that nits make, and we've got to get them out. So here we've got a lovely... It's a knit comb, isn't it? It's like the ones that we used to use when my kids were at primary That's right. school. And this, this early style is the same exactly as now. This one's made of uh, bone, however. And the little tiny teeth work in exactly the same way because, guess what, they're the same nits, uh, laying the same size eggs, and we've got to draw them out. Yeah, you get all the... Eggs, don't you, all That's the way right. along there? I That's right. That, yeah. And we also used lavender oil uh, in the hair, and that also is still used. Oh, it is a beautiful smell. That was part of the job of the nit picker, getting out the nits, rubbing the hair afterwards, or the shaved scalp, as often was the case, with lavender oil in attempt to deter it. But, of course, it let from wig to wig, and wig maker to wig maker. What's this disgusting stuff? This is about as disgusting as it gets, isn't it? Is it? Oh, it's lard or it, something, isn't it's it? It's big fat. It's disgusting, isn't it? And that is put, the Stuart people would put a little blob of this, this was an idea, and then put it round the neck in a silver filigree basket here. They wore lard. Yeah, it's attractive, isn't it? What for? The idea is, although lice and nits are dependent on blood to live, they also live on dead skin. Sometimes wigs were treated with flour and baked or other treatments on the wigs, which meant that they couldn't get into the scalp and take the blood to make them live. So they'd climb down and try and get so the lard? We tried to draw them, so they would be drawn, say the Stuart people would put this thing here with the idea that this would go then into the basket. But despite the lavender oil and the lard necklace, surely your wig would get jam-packed full of nits and lice and things, wouldn't it? Samuel Pepys writes um, at one point in one of his diaries how furious he was that his barber had sent him a wig that was absolutely thick with knits. It vexed me, he said, that it would be sent in this condition. It had to be sent back to be cleaned. Very poor people, however, wigs were very fashionable, remember, mm. couldn't necessarily afford a wig. To walk round with a shaved head, which in itself, of course, was cleansing, was still a bad thing to be seen on the streets. So people went along to the barber's shop and there would be a box and you put your hand inside the box, you paid threepence, you didn't know what was in there, you knew yeah. it was wigs, but you didn't know what they looked like, and you took your lucky dip, we think that's where it came from, pull out a wig, and if it was disgusting and covered in knits, then you could, for a penny hate, have another go. Knit picking was disgusting, but it didn't damage your health. There was another, more dangerous pest control job. Fumigators had the choking task of purging houses by burning sulphur. The fumes were supposed to prevent infestations and infections such as the plague. They didn't. In fact, they just ruined the fumigator's lungs. Sulphur could also be mixed up into a disgusting emulsion for the walls. So we've got lime in here and the sulphur and an egg. That's right, to emulsify. Anything else? Yes, we're going to put urine in now. Of course we are. If it's a worse job, it's got to be urine, isn't it? And then we tosh it onto the walls. That's right. And what does it do? This acts as a protection against burrowing insects, particularly, and was painted on walls uh, in an attempt to protect these insects coming in here that we know uh, obviously bring great disease with them. This is another form of pest control, and professional builders would put this on walls. We know about how sulphur was used to disinfect houses in another way. There was a man called James Auger who had brought over a recipe with him for something he believed was very important in disinfecting against plague. 
and that was amber, saltpetre and sulphur. And he'd toted this recipe all over Europe before bringing it before the Privy Council of Charles II in this country, who granted him licence to use it for the purpose of fumigation. Fumigation, of course, is a dangerous business. Now, here's the powdered sulphur, and I'm going to ask you now, Tony, to vaporise some of this into the flame to give us the proper feeling and smell of what this would have been like when we were fumigating a house. And that's why you've put us in a, in a different room, because... Uh... It does smell so much. And also because it's dangerous to fabrics, furniture, and of course us. So you need to be very careful with this. And I just Watch put it in here fumes. like this? That's right. It's very toxic. Sulphur dioxide. Oh, can you see, you see it going? The fumes going now. Yeah. <coughs> no, I'm getting fumes now in my throat. Quite tight. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so I just got, yeah. <coughs> Whoa. Oh, it's going. Yeah. Drop it in there, quick. OK. Come on, let's get out. I think we ought to go out, actually. It's just really stinky, isn't it? You're right, John. <coughs> <coughs> oh, I rather took everybody by surprise, I think. Certainly the crew. <coughs> but I think you'll understand why they took such extraordinary precautions when you see the kind of diseases that they could contract. In the Stuart period, there was an enemy far more terrifying than an army or household vermin the deadly Yersinia pestis, otherwise known as the plague. Epidemics had come and gone over the centuries, but in 1665 there was a double whammy. Extra virulent forms of bubonic plague carried by rats and the airborne pneumonic plague. The symptoms were horrific. The glands swell up to form the characteristic buboes in the armpits and groin, which later burst and ooze fetid pus. The blood vessels rupture and leak under the skin, causing dark bruises. When the infection enters the lungs, the victim coughs up a bloody froth, spreading the disease through the air. The only compensation is that you could be dead within hours. The plague was so infectious that a third of the population of London died. A whole army of people were employed to try and contain the disease. My first job is the seekers of the dead. Despite the title, finding the dead wasn't the point. The seekers or searchers' role was to examine the corpses and decide how they died, like a form of untrained coroner. Who were these women who were searching for the dead? I was going to say ordinary old women like you and me. <laughs> ordinary old women in the village, yeah. um, in the village or the town, probably pensioners, people who are dependent on charity in any case. And to be the searcher of the dead, which is what the title is, would mean that they got a bit of extra money. So would we say, right, this is a plague victim? Well, I think we'd be very tempted to say so. She's got typical blackish, purplish blotches on her face and further down. But what's most characteristic diagnostic of plague is that she's clearly had some kind of abscess under her jaw, probably in the lymph glands, and that's the plague bubo. But we think we'd have to spend a bit of time talking to other people in the household. You find out what the person has been going through, what form illness they've taken. I mean, they, they wouldn't just look at the bodies and say, oh, this is this, this is that. They would definitely take the time to ask around and to see what other evidence there was of why the person had died. How would these people have been regarded in the village? With a mixture of sort of respect and perhaps fear also, because they do have a quite a lot of power in the sense that they can come into your house and they pronounce on what the person has died of. I think anybody's very cautious about making a plague diagnosis because it has such implications for the family. It means shutting the house up and preventing other people from leaving and so on and so forth. Might we have been tempted to take a few bob just to say... Uh, well, oh no, given, given that it would have such consequences for the household, uh, we might just be a bit fuddled or a bit careless about how we noted it down. The Seekers of the Dead gathered information for bills of mortality, the lists of weekly deaths and their supposed causes. From them, parishes could spot new outbreaks and try and prevent them spreading. But it was a pretty imprecise science. One of the things about the bills of mortality is it's not modern diagnostic medicine. A lot of it uh, is simply describing the symptoms. So somebody might be said to have died of a cough uh, or of rising of the lights, which means a kind of suffocation or of dropsy or tympany, swelling of the abdomen, um, or, of a, or of a thought or of a stroke or planet struck. A whole range of things that tell you what happened, but don't to us explain why it happened. Why would they do it? Why would you be poking around with people who could give you diseases that could kill you? If you're paid threepence or fourpence for viewing a corpse, that's worth having. 
and sometimes you don't have any choice. I think if you're an old poor person, then you really don't have much option. But far worse than examining corpses would have been actually having to pick them up and carry them off to be buried. Imagine handling rotting bodies and trying to avoid the pus oozing from the burst buboes. At the very least, it was tough physical work. Inside the city of London, they used to have guys with carts who'd fill them up with the dead bodies and then ride with them through London at night so that they could avoid direct contact with the rest of the population. But where they didn't have carts, they might use a canvas hold-all thing like that, or particularly when there were slopes, they'd use a hay sledge like this one, which they would pull by hand. <sighs> Initially, everybody got a proper burial, but after a while, when there were so many dead bodies, they just used to dig a big pit and then they'd throw the bodies in and cover them with lime and chuck earth on top of that. It was actually a nightmare of a job being one of these buriers for two reasons. Firstly, because you were forced to live inside the cemetery. And secondly, you were only allowed to work when it was dark, so it must have been virtually impossible for them to see what they were doing. But I could probably just about handle being a plague barrier and a seeker of the dead I could possibly do. But there's one plague job I couldn't touch with a barge pole. Yes. Aren't they gorgeous? There's nothing like that little mewing noise and the warm, soft fur of the nation's favourite pets, is there? But during the plague, they were thought to carry disease, which brings us to our next worst job. The parishes of London hired dog and cat killers, and they had a cull. 40,000 dogs and 80,000 cats and kittens were put to their death. At rates of pay between one and two pence a carcass, the killers were well on their way to earning the national average wage of a shilling a day. Mind you, they didn't use humane methods, they used anything they could get their hands on. Knives, logs of wood, clubs, mallets. But it was all a tragic waste, because we now know that these are exactly the kinds of animals that could have kept the rat population down, and plague is carried by the fleas on rats. So poor little Bobo and little Truffles lost their lives in vain. They say never work with animals, but it was a tip completely ignored by the people who did my next worst job. They were in the business of advertising quack medicines, and the gimmicks they used were as dodgy as the products. This is a toad. He's quite harmless unless you try to eat him, in which case he exudes this foul-tasting liquid which makes you feel pretty ill. And yet in Stuart times, there was actually a job which involved putting one of these little things into your mouth. Welcome to the weird world of the toad eater. Popping down the market was the nearest thing ordinary folk had to nipping down the doctors for a course of antibiotics. For the stall holders in search of a quick sale, it was a matter of putting your money where your mouth is. Why on earth did people eat toads? Well, I think it's money. I think it comes down to money in the first place. So these are people who are essentially the sidekicks of a quack doctor, someone who's trying to sell their medicines. And he's employing someone to either swallow a toad or pretend to swallow a toad as a means of demonstrating the powers of the medicine that the quack doctor wants to sell to his public. If you see someone actually swallowing a toad, which is meant to be poisonous, and things being recovering, then, uh, yeah, wow, that's quite sensational. Toad Eater, or Toady, became the nickname for any kind of servile creep or crawler. 
In return for a few pennies, people were even prepared to eat tapeworms or dangle snakes round their necks. What kind of lives do you think these toadies would have lived? Well, along with the quack doctor who employed them, uh, I would have thought they were probably itinerant. A lot of quack doctors this period moved around. One, because you want to get away from the scene of the crime, so to speak, to satisfy clients. And the other thing is you moved around from fair to market around the region, uh, because that's where all the custom is. It's starting to get a bit frisky. <laughs> Do you think they really did swallow them? And this is the question. I mean, in all the information we have, it's very unclear. Um, you get sort of doubting comments in diaries in the 17th century saying, do you know someone who's actually sort of eaten one of these toads? And I say, well, so-and-so told me they've eaten the toad. So, I mean, there's various options. One is they ate the toad and had a, suffered an upset stomach afterwards, yeah. which you would. I mean, you're not going to die from eating a toad. But certainly the sort of toxins in the skin there would make you upset. Perhaps they regurgitate it, and that's another option. My own feeling is that it's a con trick. You know, it's a bit of sleight of hand. It's got, it's got to be. Isn't yes, it? I, I think so. I mean, it's just not worth the pain <laughs> for the toad eater of indulging in this. When perhaps you know, you know, he can practice and be a skilled uh, bit of sleight of hand will do the trick just as well. But modern science knows what the Stuarts didn't, that maybe a toad slipping down your throat wasn't as dangerous as the toad eaters made out. It wouldn't kill you, so the trick was safer than you might think. Right, I'm surrounded by curious onlookers. They all want this little thing to disappear inside me. Do I swallow it and throw it up afterwards? Or do I just palm it? This is not a very nice idea, but... Uh... In 1666, following the Great Plague, London was wiped out by another natural disaster. The Great Fire swept away huge swathes of the city and left the old St Paul's Cathedral in ruins. In its place, they commissioned Sir Christopher Wren to design a magnificent new cathedral. It was to be his masterpiece and a bold new statement to hail in a new London and a new century. It's impossible to imagine London without St Paul's Cathedral, isn't it? It's a defining landmark and the climax of the career of Sir Christopher Wren. In fact, on his tombstone it says, if you want to see my monument, look around you. Although, of course, it wasn't just Wren who built this place. It was built by thousands of people whose names we don't know. For instance, have you ever heard of James Thornhill? Probably not, although he was one of the most famous artists of his day. Famous and yet unfortunate, because his worst job was to paint the inside of that entire dome. But this worst job is a complete one-off, and Thornhill's tragic story shows that you don't have to be knee-deep in muck to have a terrible time. The cathedral took 35 years to build, and originally a French artist was commissioned to paint the murals inside the dome. But the colourful designs were too flamboyant and Roman Catholic for the new Church of England Cathedral, so the commissioners appointed James Thornhill instead. He painted in a style called grisaille, which used muted greys and browns to depict a much more restrained Protestant series of scenes from St Paul's life. There's loads of reasons why this is a worse job, but one of the most obvious is the walk to work. If you work in one of those office blocks, even at the very top, then you have the luxury of a lift. But for Thornhill, there would have been a three quarter of an hour trudge before he even got to here. Now, normally, if I went through this window, I'd end up as a rather nasty splodge on the floor below. But not today, because St Paul's is undergoing a unique restoration project, so we've got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see the inside, just as Thornhill would have seen it. The restoration team have suspended a huge scaffold from the lantern at the top of the dome, which virtually fills a quarter of the space. Thornhill wouldn't have had the benefit of such a stable structure, which is mind-blowing when you think of the scale of the building. We're really starting to get a sense of height now, aren't we? We certainly are. It's time to see the first of the Thornhill schemes starting here. This is Thornhill over here? It's all original Thornhill, yeah. So what are these rings? 
Well, we think those rings actually relate to a mid-19th century restoration that occurred here, but it, it reflects very much what we think may have been the means of access for Thornhill. These were for the scaff? Exactly. So we think wooden poles would have butted to the wall and be located to these rings with a 10 or 20 foot extension, the end of the pole being picked up by a cable running down from the dome, and then boards linking between the poles. We don't know with normal size detail about the scaffolding that Thornhill may have used, but we think probably it was uh, a fairly opened scale system. And there is this wonderful story of Thornhill almost falling to his death that was only avoided by his loyal manservant, Bentley French, who threw a bucket of paint at the wall to attract his attention and duly saved his life. It's easy to see how you could topple over backwards as the walls lean right out above you, pushing you towards the drop below. Thornhill would have had to overcome stomach-churning pangs of vertigo just to get the job done. It's an extraordinarily bizarre sense of scale that you get up here. If you look down there to that goldy thing, that's the Whispering Gallery. And then you've got the same distance below that to the floor and you've got all the tiny, tiny little people like ants. Whereas up here, you've got this bloke who's got a head three times as big as ours. How on earth? Did Thornhill manage to get the scale right on this curving shape? Well, that's a good question. We think probably he may have used a technique involving a grid and transferring from an original master drawing that was gridded up, a grid applied to the wall. And by that means, you can actually transfer quite accurately um, the layout of your figures, correct proportion and in scale. How much wall did he have to cover? Well, we think they run about 140,000 square feet. So it is a, it's a vast space. Just imagine how many cans of paint they'd have needed and Thornhill would have had to haul them up ready mixed from ground level. There's almost no natural light up here, so he'd have been working by candlelight. It's incredibly claustrophobic so, at the very top, the very as the murals seem to press heavily down on you. Dome, to paint this bit, this Thornhill would have been precariously dangling 75 metres above the marble floor below. It must have been so difficult working up here. I think incredibly difficult. It is an enormous uh, acreage of, of painted surface, working under some very difficult circumstances, teetering on the edge of some rickety bit of scaffolding, very low light levels, um, having to work with finely detailed gilding, an immense achievement. How many of them were there? Well, records have it that, in addition to Thornhill, he had incredibly only two assistants, which does seem quite extraordinary. How long did it take them? Well, it was two years. And I'm sure Thornhill was working flat out for that entire period. But Thornhill must have been quite prepared to risk plummeting to his death every day for his magnificent painting. Indeed, he was so proud of it, he incorporated his very own portrait into one of the murals. But there's a sting in the tail. Thornhill worked up there hour after hour, month after month, for his art, but he was comforted by the thought that when he'd finished, that place would be regarded as the British version of the Sistine Chapel, and it would be as much a monument to him as to Sir Christopher Wren. But ironically, by the time it was completed, the new frivolous Rococo fashion was all the rage, and suddenly Thornhill's work looked really drab and old-fashioned. So he did all that hard graft, and he never got any of the glory. That's what, for me, makes it a worse job. So, what job's on the very lowest rung of the Stuart period? Sedan chair bearing may have been physically demanding, but at least you were running your own business. Swallowing toads wouldn't have been as unpleasant as it sounds if you'd mastered the techniques of sleight of hand. And a salt peter man's lot may have been smelly and unpopular, although you weren't likely to get blown up by your own explosives like the petadier's assistant. But for me, the very worst job comes from the underside of the world of culture the violin string maker. Now, you might be thinking, oh, violin string maker, very nice job. Well, you'll understand why it isn't when you see what's involved. The Stuart period was pivotal to the development of the violin as we know it because of technological advances in violin string making. It wasn't just virtuoso violinists that made Vivaldi famous. Oh no, it needed something just a little bit earthier. The guts of a sheep. The 17th century was the golden age of string making because of the development of a string short enough to fit a violin and play low notes, giving us the four-stringed instrument we have today. String makers were precision craftsmen, often trained on the job in a family-run business. Although known as catgut strings, they were always made from sheep innards, 
But unlike the modern stream maker, 300 years ago, they had to get their hands on their own raw materials, literally, which meant a series of unimaginably gory and gruesome tasks. And that's where I start my apprenticeship. Morning. What do I cut this open with then? Right, we need a knife. Best to start off with the small one there. I'll tell you what I'm worried about more than anything else. These sleeves are so long and droopy, I think they're going to get... Well, that's for keeping them warm, so the I'd door. take the outer layer off and oh, it should be easier then. Give us a hand. Yep, gotcha. How long has this one been dead? Oh, not long. You can see it's still warm there. Right, where do I plunge? Ah, no, no, no. You're trying to kill a man if you're doing that. Yeah. And you finish up with bits everywhere that you don't want. You need a pinch and go through on the side. That's it. Am I coming just towards, towards me? Yeah, yeah, just so you've got an incision. That's him. Yeah. Right, now we can find that spot. You're going to cut down, Yeah. like so. No, it's not the nipples. Side, yeah, bits of nipples in the way, that's always the yeah. problem. Oh, yeah, ah, don't, go, don't go deep, Yeah. because if you penetrate the guts, we're going to finish up with grass soup inside and everything else. Oh, oh, God. That's all right, there's just some blood that's pulled inside the belly somewhere. Right. Now, we're heading down. Yeah. You've got to find your way all the way down to the anus yeah. and cut around there, because if you're taking the guts out, that's where it's anchored at one end. Ah, oh, here's the bum. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's the poo, isn't it? That's the poo, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, that's hey, it. just come at on, the my spill darling. point. Yeah. Oh, listen to that noise. It's, yeah, like it's a got frothy, you see. That's the gas in the belly. Well, that's basically a fart coming out there. Ugh. Oh, <laughs> I think that's sucking at the other end now. That's deeply. Oh, oh, and it's God. smoking. <laughs> Steam rather than smoke. <laughs> so slippy, all the guts it's, it's are all running through the spill. fingers. Yep. Okay. Uh, oh, there it goes. Oh, God, that smell is foul, <laughs> isn't it? What you're doing is basically pulling his <sighs> rectum back through his belly. There we are. Yuck. Now, that's going to take some sorting out down there. I think we better go and get it all cleaned up. Because the really unpleasant bit is getting all the excrement out of the inside so that it's clean to work with afterwards. So we've done the pleasant bit? Yeah, this is the easy bit. Which bit are we after? Well, we're looking for the smaller bit of the intestine, so that's going to be this section. It's all coiled up in itself. There's probably something like 30 yards of it in here. Yeah. And we've got to, first of all, just strip it away from everything else that the membranes attach it to. So yeah. Like that. Just keep pulling it. If you rupture it, then you're going to get all the excrement from the insides plastered all over yourself. Yeah, so I can feel that yeah. fiddling around in my fingers. Not to mention the fact you won't be able to get a decent tune out of it later. <laughs> break an end off for you. Right, now, the next thing you've got to do, here's a bowl, oh, just milk, in here. milk it down into there. Milk it? Well, it's... it's oh, look, look at that. That, that is there. very, very, very unpleasant. Ugh, <laughs> oh, look at that stuff. The bowl. Remember the fumigator? Stream makers had to endure the stench of burning sulphur too, while they fumigated racks of finished strings in a pit to produce a whiter colour. Yes, yes, just pop it onto there. And I'll just pour put that on the bench. Yeah, I'll just start pouring the water down. You can have the grotty job. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, look at that move. I'm cold, I'm wet, I'm covered in gunk. It stinks, there's nowhere to wash. And presumably there'd be people doing this 12 hours a day. At the time they need to get some new supplies in, yeah, the stream makers would be doing this pretty solidly. Yeah, it's all still twisted, isn't it? Keep an eye on that bowl there, you don't want it to overflow. No, it. it's falling out of the bowl! <laughs> it's gone everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Don't wave it at me. I'm not waving, it's still wriggling. <laughs> yeah, that's the first foot done, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Only another 29 foot to go. <laughs> who was prepared to rip out the guts of a sheep and turn them into ultra-modern violin strings, the violin would have remained the humble vial, and the works of the great composers like Bach and Beethoven would never have existed at all. Join me next week as I swill out the underbelly of the Georgian period to explore some more worst jobs in history. <laughs>